David, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, giving me your time. Bluntly, David, welcome to the private sector. Can you tell us how Kroll persuaded you to come on board? Martin, hi, it's great to see you again and, and chat to you about uh, all things AML. Yeah, as you mentioned, I've now joined Kroll. I'm leading their global AML advisory service within the forensic investigations and intelligence uh, bit of their world. I've known them for many years. They have a reputation for innovative investigative skills. These days, they are doing a lot with new technology. They made it very clear to me over many conversations how they were committed to improving the effectiveness of anti-money laundering regimes, you know, using their their, their broad skill set for investigations up to doing all the kind of the big data analytics, looking at beneficial ownership registries and so on. And so it was really an opportunity for me to continue my work and go from talking about the need for more effective practice while I was at FATF to actually doing it. And I'll be a bit more focused. I'll be working one case at a time, one country at a time, but being able to apply the sort of broad set of skills that I've got and that Kroll have got to really improve the investigation and prosecution of money laundering, to make regulators more effective, to make FIUs more effective, get a chance to do the work again. That was all the public sector. Is that your client, prospect client market? Prospect client is public and private. Initially, it's going to be heavily focused on governments, policy making departments, AML, CFT committees, strategy setting bodies, financial intelligence units, law enforcement, regulators, supervisory bodies, and then following that financial institutions. So it's the whole show where there's a real gap in support now for the AML regime is in support for governments. And there are very few people doing that. You're already in contact with some of these governments? Yeah. So, I mean, I was fortunate as soon as governments found out I was leaving FATF, there was a queue at the door. So, you know, it's very flattering. I'll have to find out how much I can help them in practice. But I'm pretty confident that with the team of Kroll behind me and the ability to build practice over time, you know, we'll be able to do some good things. And as you know, it's all about effectiveness. To that end with effectiveness, what, what change do you think you're going to bring there to country X? Is it in the investigation, the prosecution? And on more widely, something we spoke about last night, is it ensuring their strategy is right? I think it starts with the right strategy and obviously ensuring that that's aligned with what FATF expects. And contrary to maybe what a lot of people think, what FATF is saying now is actually aligning more and more with the kind of bottom-up messages you're hearing from people who work in, in the private sector. And what you've got is a world of mixed messages in between and, and supervisors not doing a good job. Definitely improving investigations and prosecutions. I mean, that's a, a key part of it. But it's seeing that within a more strategic approach and making sure that governments are doing this for the right reasons. They have a long-term commitment to this. They're not just doing it to pass their FATF evaluation or to get off the blacklist. Obviously, those are, those are key drivers for governments, but this is about ensuring that they have a long-term plan in place, that they can deliver on the ground, not just about passing laws and regulations to tick the boxes, as we often say, but to actually have an impact in terms of the money laundering problem in their countries. To their countries, do enough people at all levels, community, private sector, public sector, understand money laundering? So when we talk about British Virgin Island companies or Cayman companies, that's not where the money is. And moreover, it's not buying assets in those countries, is it? So the money's originating from crime. It's still crime, but it's stolen from public funds. It's a proceeds of drug trafficking, whatever proceeds now of environmental crime. And it's being used to buy assets. We're looking at the Pandora Papers in major cities of the world, major Western cities. Therefore, it's using Western banks, Western lawyers, Western accountants, maybe using a BVI company. Do people understand what money laundering is? So I think it depends on who you're talking to. I think uh, the practitioners in FATF do. The higher up you go into governments at official level and certainly at a leader level, the less it's understood. And this comes back to what we've discussed before. What are we trying to achieve here? Is the goal to stop money laundering? Is it to protect the financial integrity of the financial system? And far too often, the goal once you get to political level is avoiding the FATF grey list to protect from the economic impacts of that. And you've lost complete sight, therefore, of why we're trying to do this. And I think if you don't retain sight of that all the way up to political level, then the conversation stops being about how money is laundered and therefore what needs to be done to stop it. And it starts being more about how do we get off this list or how do we avoid getting onto the list? Well, let's go away from that. Let's go back to the positive 
actions of 2022, which is what we're talking about. Let's look at what are we going to do to stop money laundering? You must have ears who have heard to listen to that. And you've clearly said it many times. We stop money laundering to save lives. That message is out there. You know, in the six years you were there, moving away from the negative story, what people don't understand, there were some great positive achievements you personally achieved, but the FATF achieved. So, yeah, I, if we look back to 2012-13, FATF had just completed its third round of mutual evaluations. There was an element of assessing effectiveness as part of that, but it was very much from a technical compliance point of view. And what we saw was at the end of, you know, that was, what, 20, 25 years after FATF was created, a lot of countries had criminalized money laundering, criminalized terrorist financing, they'd established FIUs introduced regulation and supervision of the financial sector. A lot of countries also designated non-financial professions and businesses, lawyers, accountants, and so on. But we weren't really seeing any results of that. And to be honest, fat evaluations hadn't looked very closely at the results of all of that. Um, so I was fortunate in that I came in after the FATF had agreed a methodology for assessing effectiveness. And it completely shifted its focus from technical compliance to conversations with governments about, well, what are you actually doing? What investigations are these leading to? What is the jail sentence or the sanction at the end of it? Is that dissuasive? And is all of that activity commensurate to the risks? And by the way, do you understand your risks? The nature of the evaluation process changed significantly. Those first few FATF plenary discussions with countries who have been subject to that evaluation were very difficult. Because you had you know, mm -hmm. people like yourselves with your old hat on, truly committed law enforcement professionals sitting there in the plenary, being told that what they were doing wasn't good enough and they needed to be doing more. And it felt, I must have felt to them that they were having their commitment and their kind of professional integrity question. So it was a brave conversation to start happening. But countries bought into it and they realized it was good for them. You know, we were able to do it. We evolved the way we were doing it in a way which gave credit as well as identified shortcomings. So you'll see this in, in mutual evaluations. Often there's a lot of good stuff in there, as well as bad stuff. That's been a major thing. Long way to go. But the shift to effectiveness and the discussions now being about effectiveness, I think, is the single biggest thing. There's a question about, does our focus on effectiveness just focus on activity and rather than, than outcomes? But the outcomes thing is a really difficult area to look at objectively. Because you need to know, well, how much money is being laundered? How much money is being laundered to the country? What are we doing in terms of making an impact on that problem? And that's just a really difficult, possibly impossible thing to measure. So I think what the FASF is doing now by putting the focus on what investigations and prosecutions are happening, which terrorist groups are you going after? How can you demonstrate you're taking action on the right ones and proportionate action? I think are the right conversations to be happening. And it's starting to have an impact and filter down to, you know, the supervisory agencies and the regulated businesses. That's the biggest growth area, though, and we should come on to that, because if you look at the areas of success in FATF, the areas of least success are preventive measures by firms and the supervision of those, where you've got virtually 100% countries failing on preventive measures by firms, 75% of countries failing on supervision. And that's what you know, most of the people listening to this will be experiencing on, you know, in their daily lives because they'll be working in the private sector. It's very difficult to measure what we have prevented, though, isn't it? I mean, for example, if we take a different story, imagine somebody had prevented the one MBD scandal. You'd never measure it that it saved $7 billion for Goldman Sachs. It's a very difficult thing to measure. And I've always pondered, where do money launderers submit their returns to that allows us to work out this is how much money laundered every year? So it's all hypothetical. Who knows, right? Yeah, and I think this is part of the problem. And I've used it before because it's helpful to get political support. You can talk about, is it $2 trillion, is it $4 trillion, is it $6 trillion a year that's laundered? We know banks spend between 200 and $300 billion a year on compliance. And we know that less than 1% of the proceeds of crime is seized at the end of that. So that gives you the big picture problem. But the reality is there's no real way of identifying the total proceeds of crime. And that, of course, makes prevention and me measuring prevention really, really difficult because you just don't see it. You don't know which customers have not, which dodgy customers, which money launderers have decided not to come to your bank because, or your country, because you've got these measures in place. Having worked in the private sector, I do believe that I can, and I have made my firms I've worked for, banks I've worked for, a more hostile environment 
Take Jeffrey Robinson's words. Dirty money is like water. It seeks the course of least resistance. So when the money launderers find that course, the money will flow through. If they find there's some bumps in the road or somebody's tightened up the plumbing at a certain place, word will equally get around. You know, it's a little bit more difficult there. So you go somewhere else. So it is possible. And I think, you know, that endeavor is a worthwhile outcome. Don't think there's enough spoken about where people have been successful. We look at the NatWest case we spoke about last night. Clearly, the success that comes out of that, there was, there was some people calling it out all the time. The message had got in there. A lot of people called out those issues. Unfortunately, it wasn't acted upon as it could have been acted upon. But your message from the FATF, the message from the government, and, and the message about money going back, lots of people in that West got it and called it out and reported issues, which is very encouraging. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting is every time there's a bank final enforcement action reported, there's a section of the media that picks up on it and says, look, this is yet another example that the money launderers are getting away with it, that the system's broken. What they don't realise is that most of those cases have probably come about from the bank itself identifying it and self-reporting, and it may have stretched back several years. In fairness, that one, that's not the case with that West case, but in fairness, right? But nonetheless, close Act 2016. So we are in time to conclude that in the past six years since then, they've improved it a great deal. But there's some of these improvements are simple, aren't they? So that's cash. Your Apollo said this. Cash still is king in crime. Your check doesn't work. It'll either bounce or it creates an unwanted order trail for you and customers. And banks can control. We spoke about this last night. The message I'd like to get out in training and to tell people and to energize the fellow professionals in the AML community is you are in charge. You do have control here. And you can say, for example, I'm not going to take any BVI companies. I'm not going to take any. UK LLP entities, and I'm not going to take cash above value of X. How do we give them the strength to that? You've been to an event, we spoke about before, where the CEOs of the banks were there. Is that message getting through to the CEOs? So I think it is now. And, um, you know, there's a debate at the moment about whether bank fines work, and I personally don't think they do. They probably just promote a greater tick box approach and hiring armies of people on the compliance side, not necessarily changing what happens on the business side. However, where they have worked is that you can now have discussions and discussions have happened at CEO level and it's started to change the culture in some of the biggest banks around the world. If you speak to CEOs now of the biggest banks, they are familiar with the issues and they're personally brought into dealing with it. Of course, these are huge banks. It's a hell of a challenge they've got to turn these ships around. But it does feel like there is a culture has changed. Let's hope it continues. Often we see with, you know, regulatory swings from one you know, tight regulation to light touch regulation that attitudes can change over time. But right now, I think if you're working in compliance, you have a real opportunity to get support from the top and you can afford to be brave and say, this is what we should do. We shouldn't take cash in this way. This is how we should handle cash. You need to be mindful of the unintended consequences. And what you don't want to do is inadvertently cut off whole countries or customer segments because you're taking an overly, overly risk-averse approach. As we've talked about before, yeah. it's about risk management, not necessarily risk avoidance. There are certainly some things and some bits of the world that you need to be very careful about, but you can take control because you do have support, I think, in, in the biggest banks from the top at the moment. Away from the banks, do you have a strategy to influence and change the thinking of regulators, some of whom, and you said this before, some of whom have a zero tolerance of failure, which clearly is not a risk-based approach? Yeah, so it's interesting. I've spoken to a number of banks, including a number of countries' regulators, when they were looking to join the FATS, and they sit there very, very proudly and say they've got a zero tolerance approach. And, you know, I, I feel a bit puzzled. That's not what anyone's asked for. Don't expect banks to be a complete safety net. To be successful, you have to let some money laundering go through. What you have to make sure is what you're focused on is the biggest area of risk and where you can have the biggest impact given the resources you've got. And so I don't think supervisors have properly understood that. I think they have promoted this kind of complete zero tolerance approach, but they're getting better. FATF's doing a lot to support that, including by providing guidance to regulators on what it means to take a risk-based approach to supervision. And there's a lot more nuance in that than we've seen in the past, but supervisors are starting to get it. And I think with the pressure coming up from the banks and from Wolfsburg, I think we'll start to see supervisory activity improve, and then we'll see activity driven in banks improve. Because ultimately, banks are not doing what they're doing because FATF are asking for it. They're doing it because of the guy who comes in from the supervisory authority is saying that's what needs to happen. Until we change attitudes and make supervision more risk-based, 
the activity in banks is not going to be respected. On behalf of everybody who's going to listen to this, I wish you well. And I look forward to speaking to you in a year's time to find out how it's going. Thanks, Martin.